bring the meeting to order and can I welcome you to this, the 19th meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2017. Can I remind members and others in the room to switch phones and other devices to silent? The first item on the agenda today is consideration of two new petitions. The first petition for consideration is Petition 1671, Sale and Use of Glue Traps, by Lisa Harvey and Andrea Goddard on behalf of Let's Get Mad for Wildlife. And can I also welcome Marie Todd, MSP, who has an interest in this petition. Two written submissions in support of the petition are included with our meeting papers from the SSPCA and from the petitioners, which takes the form of an open letter from 10 wildlife charities to the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform. The organisations signed up for the petitioner submission are um, Humane Society International UK, Let's Get Mad for Wildlife, Scottish Wildlife Trust, One Kind, the Mammal Society, Scotland for Animals, Wildlife Cons Conservation Research Unit, PETA UK, Rare Bird Alert and Birders Against Wildlife Crime. Can I welcome Andrea Goddard to the meeting along with Claire Bass, Executive Director of Humane Society International UK and Elizabeth Molyneux, a veterinary surgeon for the Wild Animal Welfare Committee. Can I thank you for attending this morning? You have the opportunity to make a brief opening statement of up to five minutes, and after that, the committee will ask a few questions to help um, inform our consideration of the petition. Thank you, convener. I would like to thank you for inviting me um, to give evidence at today's committee meeting. I'm truly grateful for this opportunity. I would also like to thank um, Claire here and Elizabeth um, for assisting me today in providing evidence in support of this petition. Advice from Libby Anderson from One Kind, Marie Todd, MSP and others have also been, has also been invaluable. In January of this year, Lisa Harvey, my co-petitioner, discovered in a pet shop a female blackbird which had been trapped upon a glue board which had been placed on the ground by a pest control company, presumably to catch rodents. The blackbird was still alive and had torn off her own leg, tail feathers and most of one wing in her attempt to escape. Lisa was so distressed by what she found that she reported it to the store and posted the story on social media. The story went viral and many who commented said that they couldn't believe that these traps were legal. As an online wildlife campaigner, I picked up on the story and contacted Lisa to ask if she would be interested in setting up a petition to support a ban on these devices from Scotland. And so, with my help, we did just that, and as you can see, the petition gained just under 5,100 signatures in six weeks. Since then, we have been speaking to our local MSPs and other animal welfare organisations to garner support. Consequently, myself and the Humane Society International have put together an open letter signed by 10 prominent wildlife organisations to the Cabinet Secretary, Secretary for the Environment, Rosanna Cunningham, to which we are awaiting her formal response. You should all have a copy of this letter. You should all also have a copy of the SSPCA's written evidence, which very much supports asking for a ban on glue traps. Generally, we are concerned that rodent glue traps are a crude and often ineffective method of wildlife control that inflicts unnecessary suffering. They are indiscriminate and are used and misused excessively and inappropriately. Glo ro rodent glue traps are widely sold and available for for public purchase across Scotland and for as, little, for as little as 99 pence for two traps. Their use is completely unregulated and it has not been possible to establish how many traps are sold and used each year, but given their prevalence in shops and online, it is likely many thousands. Glue traps are designed to trap and immobilise mice and rats, but not kill them. Trapped animals may suffer in many different ways, the glue can clog eyes, nose and ears. The animal may tear and chew fur and limbs off in an attempt to free him or herself. If the person who has set the trap does not return frequently to check it and dispatch the trapped animal, ultimately the animal will die a slow death from starvation, dehydration and or exhaustion. Animals caught on a glue trap are defined as being under the control of man and are thus subject to the Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Act 2006 which dictates that animals must be dispatched humanely. In practice, members of the public or poorly trained professionals are often unaware of their responsibilities to deal with a trapped animal and are unwilling or unable to dispatch a trapped animal humanely. A YouGov poll commissioned by the Humane Society International in 2016 revealed that a significant percentage of the public would dispose live trapped animals in dustbins inflicting slow and agonising deaths or even drown them. 
The majority of glue trap manufacturers do not supply appropriate warnings or instructions on their packaging, and so often um, users commit offences under the Animal Welfare Act, inflicting unnecessary suffering but are unaware that they are doing so. Additionally, it is an offence under the Wildlife and Countryside Act to, to set glue boards in a place where legally protected species might be caught. Nonetheless, many instances of trapped birds, reptiles, amphibians and even pets have been recorded. These instances are doubtless under-recorded as the unwitting perpetrator will not report their own crime and the evidence is easily disposed of. In 2010, the Pest Management Alliance issued a Code of Best Practice for glue boards. These principles are not statutory, however state that glue boards should only be sold or used by adequately trained and competent professionals. All other co options for rodent control must be considered before glue boards are used. Glue boards must be inspected within 12 hours of placing. Detailed records and location plans must be made and copied. Trapped rodents must be dispatched humanely. As glue boards are widely available to the public, the very first principle is being totally ignored by shops and manufacturers, and these guidelines are not supplied with the majority of glue traps, nor are these principles policed in any way. This, in effect, renders the entire code of practice ineffectual and rather pointless. We believe that the current widespread use and misuse of glue boards in Scotland is causing significant and completely unnecessary suffering both to target and non-target species. There is absolutely no logic in allowing the sale of these items to the untrained public for DIY control. We would not dream of allowing the sale and use of such products to catch, for example, feral cats, and the suffering these products inflict on mice and rats is equally unacceptable. The professional pest control industry may argue that glue traps should be regulated for use in certain situations in which other control methods cannot be used or have already failed. In considering this point of view, we refer the committee to the regulations in place in New Zealand, which tightly restricts the use of rodent glue traps to professional pest controllers in only very limited situations. These crude, indiscriminate and horrific devices do not belong in any progressive, forward-thinking country. We urge this committee to recommend legislative action to prohibit the public sale and indiscriminate use of glue traps in Scotland. We suggest consultation with a range of expert groups, which we can recommend, to implement primary legislation or potentially amendment of Section 11 of the Wildlife and Countryside Act to prohibit glue boards as a method of taking wild animals. Such a ban would enjoy broad public support and would show that Scotland takes the welfare of all animals, pest or otherwise, seriously. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Can I just <clears throat> maybe an opening up for um, terms to help us um, consider the petition? It's your view that we just simply there should be no public sale of these traps at all, or are there any circumstances in which you think professionals should be allowed to use them? We um, we sympathise with pest control companies in in so far as they have to provide the service to people who have got a pest problem. Um, but there are lots of alternative methods that they can use um, to, to dispatch these animals. Um, so we can we can suggest other alternative methods, such as uh, that you can get some electrocution boxes where the the rats or mice go in and they get electrocuted inside, and it's a much more humane way of controlling so these animals. Discriminate use to actually your preference is that there shouldn't be any use. Well, ultimately, we, we wouldn't like to see any use of them at all because they are completely horrendous and inhumane. Um, I'm not sure if you want there to come in there. There are examples in other countries. For example, New Zealand stopped a public sale of them in uh, 2010 and gave the industry five years mm. to sort of sort itself out and stop using them. And they're now in a position as of 2015 where you need ministerial approval to get a licence to use the glue trap. New Zealand are really tight on pest species because of their native uh, birds and nobody's applied for that licence in the last two years. So it, it just shows what the 
the industry can do, even in a country where you know rats and mice are, are really very dangerous towards native um, birds and wildlife. And Australia and Victoria, they've again put in legislation that you know just makes it so tight that pest controllers can, in theory, apply for licences for glue traps, um, but they don't very often do that because they've just found other methods of doing it. We appreciate that a licensing system might be quite a difficult thing to sort of implement, though. Thanks very much. Uh, Rona Mackay. Um, in your submission, you, you say that um, previous petitions to the UK government um, failed in their attempt to att uh, obtain a ban of these products for sale or use. Um, can you tell me what happened to those previous petitions and, and whether um, they actually got any response from the UK government? And if you, you know, just what your thoughts are on why they were unsuccessful? Um, I can't remember the exact details. Um, when I first looked at putting this petition together, I did do some research and found that the SSPCA, I believe, um, petitioned the government a few years ago. Um, I'm not sure what the details were of that and what happened. Um, but since they are still legal to buy, they clearly weren't, they clearly weren't successful, yeah, no, okay. that's true. We, okay. uh, if I might <clears throat> add to that, Andrea, we, um, I'm from Humane Society International, we, we did yeah. lobby uh, down in Westminster um, for exactly the, the things that Andrea is asking for here. Um, and this was just immediately before Brexit, um, and we were getting a lot of interest from MPs down there. Um, and there was, uh, I think there was, there was an EDM and, and questions, written questions tabled and answered. At the time, the government said they had no plans to ban glue traps um, down there but would look into uh, the possibility of replicating some of the systems that uh, Liz mentioned in Australia and, and New Zealand, uh, and then Brexit happened. So it kind of went a little bit further down the list, yeah. Thank you. Can I just ask a wee tiny... Um, this is really relating to uh, the convener's question. Um, if, do you have any idea of the sort of number of professional companies that use these, say, in Scotland or throughout the UK? What, what sort of percentage would use the glue traps? Um, we don't know total numbers. I, I wouldn't even like to sort of put a, a guess to it. I mean, a lot. Um, however, there are a, a substantial number of companies who, who proudly proclaim that they don't use glue traps on account of the welfare issues associated with them. So I think, you know, the, the industry... There's an awareness that they're, they're controversial. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh -huh. So, yeah. Uh, you know, and increasingly the, the, the traditional sort of pest control industry are trying to move towards a more ethical, enlightened approach, which doesn't immediately resort to killing everything mm -hmm. straight away. Um, <clears throat> and glue traps, you know, many companies see as a particularly sort of egregious and unnecessary method and, and, and will refuse to use them. OK, thank you. Michelle Ballantyne. Um, I want to just ask you again about the guidelines. You've mentioned it during your opening speech and you've mentioned the statutory and the non-statutory guidelines that are in place. Um, can you just um, reiterate, are you saying that there are no guidelines that, that could be put in place or are currently in place that would adequately support the use of these traps? Uh, well, there's, there's the, pest com the Pest Management Alliance have, have um, got a code of best practice that the industry... Um, would adhere, would adhere to, you would like to think. Um, it's, the, it's the public that don't ever get to see these, um, these codes of practice. That's the, that's the worry, that they, these, these codes, and uh, the principles within the codes of practice aren't at all communicated to the users of these products. Um, and that, that's the main concern that we've got here. So, so really it's about the disconnect between the public and the guidelines. In terms of professional use, where they're working under a professional registered basis, you mm -hmm. feel they are looking at the guidelines, but then do you think the guidelines are adequate in professional use? It's difficult to know, isn't it, which, which companies are adhering to them or not? I do think you, if do you, you know? adhered to the guidelines, you would very rarely use glue traps. So the guidelines yeah. start off saying everything else should have been considered and detailed records of everything else should be made. So, and this is, I guess, where New Zealand and Australia have ended up a bit, is there are still some circumstances where it might be what you think you want to use. But if you put in the full consideration of the Pest Management Alliance's code, you actually wouldn't be using them very often at all. 
But then at the other extreme, you Google these, you know, you go online and you, you can buy these and there's virtually nothing on the packet. There's nothing to even suggest you're going to have to kill an animal at the end of the day, you know. So there's a big, big disparity between the guidelines and general sale. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Brian Whittle. Good morning. Uh, our briefing states that glue traps are most commonly used by professional contractors, but you make it clear that these devices are still available for sale in the public. Although I note in your letter to the Cabinet Secretary, you've identified that a number of retailers have stopped selling the product. So what level of regulation or monitoring is applied uh, to the sale of glue traps? Yeah, um, <clears throat> as far as we're aware, none. Um, I mean, they're, they're widely available, uh, you know, in corner shops, um, you know, DIY stores, chemists, strangely, quite often sell them. Um, and so there's no control at all. Anyone can walk into any shop and buy a glue trap for, you know, 99p. Uh, our campaign uh, um, resulted in, I think it was about 220 stores, including some quite large wholesale stores like Booker's, um, making the decision to voluntarily withdraw glue traps from sale on the basis of the, the animal welfare um, concerns that we presented. But that's entirely voluntary. Um, so at the moment, there's, there's no regulation governing their, their sale or use. If I could just ask a, a supplementary. I mean, um, if, if there was regulation on, or regulation on monitoring, uh, whose responsibility do you think that lies with? Um, I have to say, uh, in Scotland, I couldn't answer that. I mean, in, we've talked to the in, uh, the Animal Plant Health Authority, um, who do regulate other traps. Um, so, for example, for breakback traps, actually, there's an exemption um, for humaneness checking for what they what they affectionately term uh, small ground vermin. So that's an is another issue that we have. But the Animal Plant Health Authority. Um, could, in, in theory, uh, be the, the responsible authority agency for considering the circumstances in which uh, the use of glue traps, as Liz said, you know, could be justified. I think it would be a very small number of cases. Um, but I don't know, for up here, I'm not sure where in Scotland what the equivalent would be. I know that when um, licences are applied for, um, for any kind of control of deer and things like that, it's, it's through SNH, isn't it? That, mm. So I'm assuming that that's the that would be the governing body in this instance as well. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Donald. Okay, thanks, um, Convener. Good morning, everyone. Um, Andrea Goddard mentioned in her opening remarks a situation where uh, I think it was a blackbird uh, was caught in a glue trap at a pet shop. I think you said, yes, that's right, yeah. um, which subsequently went went viral, uh, and I'm sure I think I actually saw that myself. Um, now, we know it's illegal under the Wildlife and Countryside Act in 1981 to use glue boards to, to trap birds. Um, however, in 2014, the Scottish Government's position was that it had no plans to ban their use for, for catching rodents, but that it planned to review aspects of policy in relation to animal traps. Um, now, I haven't noticed anything on the radar since 2014, but are, are you aware of any consultations, discussions, or outcomes from any Scottish Government reviews in this area? No. There's been no sign of anything? Not that I can recall, no, no. I'm sorry. Okay. Right, that's, we, we can <laughs> discuss that later. <laughs> can I ask if you've had conversations with the pest control industry themselves about this? And yes. We, uh, sorry, go on. I'm just wondering what their response was. I mean, it's not, I don't know if I speak for the whole committee, I hadn't been aware of this. It sounds absolutely horrendous that you could go in and, and, and buy something like this and it's unregulated. And my instinct is, well, why would you have it at all? And I just wonder whether in your conversation with, with the industry, they've explained why they think yeah. it might be necessary. With regard to the petition, um, there was there was um, about three or four pest control companies that got back to me and said that they would quite happily sign the petition. They would never, like you, you were saying, Claire, that some pest controllers are very sympathetic and they wouldn't use um, glue traps because of the humane implications. Um, so we do have quite quite a few pest control companies on board with this, um, but we did ask the um, the, the the agency that um, what was it called <laughs> the pest control agency. Um, we asked them to sign the the, the open letter, um, and they got back and said they wouldn't because of the potential bureaucratic um, implications, um, and that that's understandable. 
in the if they were still allowed, if it wasn't a complete ban. If regular, they had to, the, yeah. The, the question is whether really, is, was it more simple, simple to ban them completely rather than try to regulate something that would be very challenging to regulate? Yeah, there's, there's th the three options. There's to, uh, uh, an outright ban that would be a lot easier to implement, um, or there would be a ban with exemption clauses within it. Um, so, um, like in New Zealand, the pest control companies can apply for a license on a case-by-case -case basis um, to use glue traps. Or, like um, in Australia, in the state of Victoria, they've banned glue traps just for the for the pu for public use. Um, um, but there are quite a lot of loopholes where pest control companies can use them or people, you know, there's no regulation uh, with regards to what is classed as a pest control company and there's quite a few loopholes there, so that wouldn't be pref preferable for us. Michelle? Do you know what the volume of uses of glue traps? Do you have any idea of the turnover or the market capacity in, in Scotland? It's really difficult to get a grasp on those numbers, no, but like I said in the opening statement, um, likely thousands are used yeah. in Scotland. And just, I mean, we, we tried to get those numbers and really struggled. The only sort of indicator we had was actually when one of the large wholesalers that we um, campaigned to, uh, who, who voluntarily withdrew them from sale, told us that uh, they had been shifting, it was 100,000 traps in a four-month period through their wholesale. So that was um, UK-wide. But that's you know gives you a very rough indication um, that was Booker's, so they're you know a sizable company. Mm. Manufactured in the UK. Have you spoken to the manufacturers? Well, it's yeah. That, so one, there's one company, uh, STV Pest Control, who we um, have dealt with extensively and who have actually modified their packaging and, and withdrawn them from uh, advertised sale to the public. So that they're trying to only sell them to pest control professionals now. Um, and they're the only UK manufacturer that we're aware of, but a lot are coming in, a lot say made in China and have got really badly translated instructions and pictures of guinea pigs on the front. It's really, uh, really quite a, a, a bad, uh, confused marketplace, yeah. Thank you. Um, I think if that's all questions, we might want to think then about um, how we want to take this petition forward. I'd want to think, first of all, I would want to thank the petitioners for highlighting this is not something that I had been aware of, and it does seem pretty, um, it's an area that we would really would want people to be, to be looking at, certainly if there are other alternatives, and um, I don't know whether people have suggestions of what we might do. Uh, Brian? Can I ask in the first instance, just for my own information, where the, the, the competence of the Scottish Government lies within this? Or do they have the ability to, to ban? Well, we might want to ask them if they think they have. That might be a way of dealing with it. I suspect they must do. I mean, I don't know. What, I don't know what it would come under. But if it came under animal welfare, yeah. they have some responsibility for that. There's a separate question about whether you know, are they allowed in commercial terms to ban something. I don't know. But then, I think the only asking is whether or not we, you know, we would then write to the Scottish government. If that's not the case, we would bring right to the UK government. Mm -hmm. Well, I think if we can identify that, we can. I think in the might suggest in the first instance we write to the Scottish government. I mean, um, and really sort of picking up the point that Angus made about whether there has been any follow-on from the commitments that have already been made, um, what their area of responsibility is, and what their their view is. Michelle, I mean, obviously, Jim Hume asked the question, I think, which is in our notes, um, quite a long time ago, basically. Um, and the response was, we have no plans at this time to ban them, which does suggest they feel that they have mm -hmm. yeah, the right to do so. I think if they thought they had no authority to do it, they would at that point have said... We don't have any... We don't yeah. have the competence um, to do this. I suppose the slight issue for me is, is I, I feel... I do feel quite strongly, having read all this and listened to what's been said, that, that actually the public ban would be something that would be quite reasonable to look at. And I wonder whether we should be stating that up front if everybody was in that mind and that we should ask for consideration of what that would include if we're writing to the government rather than just saying well, could you tell us if you've done anything and then waiting for the given, cycle given the evidence we've heard we believe a compelling case has been made for a ban yeah. and that in terms of effectiveness and also just simply in terms of cruelty it's not something that is something that we'd, we want them to respond to and could they you know, outline for us what they would want to do, so it's slightly more than just saying, do you have a view in this? And also, I think, 
time perspective? Because if we write and ask, have you done anything, they write back and say no, then we write back and say it's compelling. Yeah. If, if, we're, if we're talking about the kind of numbers that have been stated here today, yeah. that's an awful and, lot and of usage while we're f in around thinking about it. In terms of the mm -hmm. kind of the industry or the professionals, are there specific groups that we should be, I mean, perhaps could ask the clerks who those groups would be that we would um, write to? We're writing to the Scottish Government looking for a ban. Can just clarify what kind of ban we're, okay. we're you know, just just a public ban because we, one of the things well, I was quite struck with was what happening in New Zealand and that they they, were, they allowed the professional bodies five years is that I right? think to, to, to to phase the whole thing out. I don't think we've got to the point where I think we're saying the the case against these traps is compelling. What is their response to that case, and what are they within they able to do, and what are they willing to commit to, and then we can then look further at. You know, I think we've not got to the point where I think we would say, how would that ban express itself just on the basis? We haven't heard, with respect, we haven't heard, heard the alternative argument of why some people in some circumstances might think they might be necessary, although I think there's been some reference to it. So my sense is we should write to them, we should write to the, the professionals. I mean, it's interesting that at least a number of these organisations have said, well, they wouldn't use them. So it may be that this is actually more of an issue for individual members of the public think they've got a problem and they're trying to sort it themselves. And some of that then might be just simply a bit of awareness. And, um, Obviously, they won't be supportive, but um, they might have some knowledge of what happened to previous petitions and things like that. And just to get their view, just to add weight yeah. to it, basically. I mean, I think what has been helpful is the open letter, because in other circumstances, we would have written to them, all these organised nationals, we yeah. think. So we have that. Yeah. That's a strong argument. I think we should yeah. reflect that in a letter to the Scottish Government. Um, and indeed, you know, it would be worth speaking to SSPCA rights and say we're very interested in this. Um, what is their awareness of where the responsibility would lie? Mm -hmm. um, and perhaps we could also find out a bit more about what New Zealand and Australia actually did in terms of legislation that might inform our thinking as well. So I think there's quite a lot... Um, there, both just in terms, I think, of responding to the, the evidence and to try and see where we can push the Scottish Government, what they actually, how they want to move forward on a commitment they've already made. Right. And the other organisation that's been suggested is the National Pests Technicians Association. So um, we can uh, ask them for their view as well. Anything else? Maria, I don't know if you want to say anything. I don't think so. I mean, I'm um, very pleased with the outcome, if that's um, what you're going to do. I've had, um, I met with Andrea, who's a constituent of mine in the summer, and I too found that there was a compelling case. And I have um, met with the government once and started preliminary inquiries much along the same lines as, as you have. I haven't had a response yet, but uh, I'm keen to progress this, and I'm very pleased to have the support of the Parliament Petition Committee to do that. OK, in that case, I think there are a number of things there that, that we can pursue. Can I thank the petitioners very much for coming along and I think the both written evidence and the evidence given today has been extremely helpful to the committee's considerations um, and I can thank you. Can I just suspend for a, a couple of minutes?
Second new petition for consideration today, which is Petition 1670 by James Cassidy on reform um, of the Scottish electoral system to make it democratic and accountable. The petition calls for a review of the current system, which allows candidates for a constituency seat to also stand on the regional list. The note by the clerk and the spice briefing provide background and context with reference to the Scotland Act 1998, the Arbuthnot Commission and the National Assembly for Wales, and notes the Scottish Government's response to Petition 1666, which states its commitment to consulting on electoral reforms this year. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. I mean, I think what it would be worth saying, I mean, clearly that maybe everybody in here should declare an interest, and that's maybe part of the problem, and I can understand from the petitioner's point of view that sense that this is an issue where politicians will have a personal experience and a direct view. From one party's point of view, it would be it is interesting that from very early on we said you couldn't stand in both, and there were exceptions in certain circumstances, and we actually fought, I think we pushed at one time for it to be something that was simply the role for all of the parties, and then once it became clear it wasn't a role for all the parties, then there came changes. And it's interesting that National Assembly for Wales, um, the Labour Party there did it for a while. I don't know if it was a, a rule for everybody. It was a rule for everybody. And they, I think, have moved, they have then moved away from that. And I can see, I actually can see the strong argument. They say, well, you've been rejected by the electorate. Why should you be able to come in on another on the list, I suppose the argument on the other side is these are effectively two elections running at the same time, mm -hmm. although they're intertwined. Brian? I think I'd be interested to, to look at I mean, the, the, whole, the whole premise of the Scottish Parliament is that um, we don't get this huge majority one way or the other in that it, it, it tends to be a, a it tends to require the uh, Parliament to, to, to work more in, in partnerships. So I'd be interested to see what the thoughts are in terms of if we change that electorate, what, what would happen to that particular system? Well, I think there are two different things. First of all, I think the acceptance of within a, a proportional representation system changes it. It just changes the nature of what happens at elections. But even within that, what, electric, what proportional representation system do you use? Yeah. And there will be different anomalies in different systems. But specifically, even within this system, we can see that there have been there's been a different iteration of it in Wales than in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And even where, and then even within Scotland, there's been a different approach taken by different parties. Mm -hmm. Now, some of that, frankly, has been about where people have been electorally. You know, in the early days, from our perspective, the Labour Party, for example, that where they won seats was in the constituency section, so they had less of an interest in the list. Smaller parties at that time would have more of an interest in the list. And so you can see that, you know, over time it's, it's, it has changed. I think sure. it's important to, to note that just now that the, the government is having a consultation to find out about electoral reforms and what the what Scottish people would like to see. So we presumably would need to ask how that's going and when it's expected to report. It just says plan for this year. Um, so that's ongoing. So I don't think we can take any anything do other, anything other than actually ask them how that's going and, and the Electoral Commission to... Mm -hmm. to find out what's what's going on with that. Michelle, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I have I have some empathy with the, the petitioner's um, position in terms of saying, well, you know, if the electorate have rejected somebody, I think perhaps what he's slightly missing is that in a constituency, particularly if you've got a sitting um, MSP who, who does a good job, um, then often the electorate will want to retain that person. They may also like another candidate and another candidate's party, and they may get a, a, a big rash of um, party votes, if you like, on the basis that they know that person's up the list and therefore would get in as well. So sometimes it's not necessarily about rejection, sometimes it's about that, that balance, because not everybody votes blindly for a party. Some people actually do, do vote different ways when it comes to the list and the constituency. Where I perhaps have a bit more empathy is where there's a sitting MSP who is not elected first past the post in their constituency and then comes in on the list. And then there could be an argument for it being undemocratic. Um, but I think, you know, it, it's a really difficult system. Um, and democracy is not perfect, whichever way you cut it. And, you know, however you arrange it, somebody will say, that's not democratic. 
Um, so I think, you know, I was looking through the papers and it says, that, you know, the Commission believes that preventing dual candidacy would be undemocratic. That was their, their view at the time. And it says the Commission has put the interests of the constitu constituent at the centre of our concerns. Um, and I do think people have spent a lot of time looking at this. Um, and I know parties, I know our party is looking at it again as well, because it does pose a problem. Um, but I think we do actually have to be very careful that we don't end up in a situation where the best candidates may not get into to Parliament. Because at the end of the day, you do want a good Parliament. Um, so we need a democratic system that is flexible enough that you end up with good people in here to actually make decisions for the country. Yeah. Anyone else? Angus? Well, just to, to say with regard to, to our party, um, certainly in 2011, um, the majority of the candidates stood on you know, constituency and and the list. But in, in the recent 2016 election, it was basically up to each individual uh, to decide whether they wanted to, to be on the list or not. And the majority who were confident of retaining their seats or, or winning a seat, they uh, didn't stand mm -hmm. on the list. Mm -hmm. So the, the party uh, gave them the option to decide themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. we, we were the same. Yeah. Yeah. We were the same. Um, it, it, I don't think, I mean, certainly um, in the early days of the Parliament, I, not, I wouldn't have been able to stand in both, but I was also wouldn't have considered it, frankly, necessary. I thought of things were... But it was interesting, I can remember in the first parliament being elected and both of the key people that I fought the seat against came in on the list. Now, at one level you think, well, that's a bit... It seems in some ways unfair because technically they'd been rejected by the electorate. On the other hand, they were people who um, also had a great deal to contribute and their party endorsed them to stand on the list. And the best example, of course, is their own... First Minister, who twice was beaten and then finally won a constituency seat, did she make a contribution while she was uh, uh, on from the list when she'd technically been rejected by the constituency? From her own party's perspective, she clearly did do so. I mean, I think at one level, I feel as if it... I think there's a really... What the petitioner highlights here is something that the parties have been wrestling with. There's no doubt that there is an issue here. There's a sense that... <coughs> It doesn't seem, if you, you've gone out and you said, I'm going to get rid of that woman, I don't want her anymore, and she pops back in, you can see that. But it's because there are two systems working together. And it's also something that has been um, looked at in some detail internally within parties and externally. But it's almost beyond anybody in this room that will have an interest in it. Mm -hmm. And so a personal interest makes it much more difficult, I think, to be objective. So I think from the point of view of how we take it forward, it would be worthwhile... Um, right into the Scottish Government and to the Electoral Commission to ask, you know, they're saying they have a view, what does that look like? Do we have a time scale? Yeah. And how would it be conducted? Because is it going to be conducted internally with the Scottish Government or are they looking at externalising that and maybe consulting more broadly with people like the petitioner who feels mm -hmm. that there has been, that democratically there's a deficit there? Mm -hmm. is, is, it, is it actually appropriate for us really to be dealing with this petition because it feels for me that it is is a matter for the electoral commission in terms of what's being asked because it is extremely difficult for us and, and i feel the electoral commission should be dealing with the parties and coming to a conclusion to ask us as elected members to decide whether or not you know we think it's fair the way we're elected it is is quite I think, difficult I, I, I understand actually what you're but i think mm -hmm. we just we're just acting on behalf of the petitioner we're mm -hmm. not uh, we don't actually have to make a decision and pass an opinion ourselves we're just we're just getting information mm -hmm. i think for the petitioner i think we're reflecting that there is an issue there mm -hmm. yeah, clearly because yeah, we've all mm -hmm. our parties and everyone else has, has wrestled with it um the Scottish Parliament does now have responsibility for its, I think, its own electoral system, and therefore it will be getting decided. Um, I mean, we made a decision around 16 to 18-year-olds and so on for local government. Um, and so that, you know, that, that the reality is that even though there may be a personal interest in it, there's also a constitutional obligation around it. So I think that if we write to the Scottish Government and to the Electoral Commission, really trying to establish certainly from the point of view of the Electoral Commission, is there an issue here? But from the Scottish Government, if they're having a review, what does that look like? How will they conduct it? How will they um, draw on the views, the very strongly held views, that this petition reflects? It's not. This is not just an individual's view. I think there is clearly 
kind of, and, and I suppose at some point it would be quite interesting where there is similar systems in other parts of the world, whether they have had the same issue, and that might be something the Electoral Commission might help us with in terms of how these um, systems work. In the reality, any electoral system, there are downsides. You know, there are, there are, there are, there are. Uh -huh. Okay, so I think recognising there are quite substantial issues there, and ask the Scottish Government really to try and put a bit of detail into their own commitment to review and to ask the Electoral Commission to reflect on the issues that have been highlighted um, in detail in the petition itself. So that's agreed. Okay, um, if we can move on then to the second agenda item, which is the consideration of continued petitions. The first continued petition for our consideration today is petition 1408 on updating of pernicious anemia, vitamin B12 deficiency, understanding and treatment. We last considered this petition on 25th of May and at that meeting agreed to reflect on the evidence we heard from the Minister for Public Health and Sport and Scottish Government officials and consider a note with the clerk a future meeting. The clerk's note provides a summary of that evidence session and I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. I'm struggling, right. to, I'm struggling to think of um, where else we could get evidence from, quite frankly. I think we've taken a lot of evidence on this uh, particular one. And uh, I, 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 certainly, I certainly don't think there's any more evidence sessions are required. It's what we now do with that that's do with this, the, the issue, I think. And I suppose, well, I don't know whether people do think there are there is anybody else who could take evidence from Angus? You've been involved with this maybe longer than anybody else, do you? Yeah. I, you? N well, I can't see where um, where else we could go for for evidence um, on this issue. To be honest, uh, I think we've we're fairly well briefed on it. Mm -hmm. yeah. I suppose what I thought when I was reading through it was just the extent to which the conversation now is a much more detailed clinical mm -hmm. debate. It's not really about it's not just about are you the level of awareness in the, in the medical profession, but there's actually now a dispute about what is what is the right approach. And I wonder whether, in in some ways, the petitioner has managed to highlight highlight something quite important that is now being looked at. I mean, and I know that she she remains unhappy with, um, you know, the kind of what what has happened. But I wonder whether, realistically, is there anything else we could be doing? Um, earlier when I read it there was a you know you had to go through it several times from my perspective new into it um, and and it seems that the conflict exists within the profession around how the guidelines should look and whether they should be rewritten um, and I think that the information is or appears to be there it's just how it's understood translated to each other and I'm, it does seem to be an internal debate for them in terms of making sure GPs and, and clinicians all understand what's available. Um, and it, I don't know whether the clerk can, can enlighten me on that, but I had the feeling by the end of the notes that what the petitioner had done had highlighted the lack of understanding of the guidelines. And actually in going through some of this work, people had actually taken the time to look at it and think about it which I guess is, is what you're referring mm -hmm. to. Well, they have established a group. I mean, I think mm -hmm. what the petitioner is asking for um, is that she wants to s speak to the to the group. Now, um, Dr Alistair Hart has said that um, a request to our meeting is at a very... Their, their work is at a very early stage. So a meeting at this stage would not be pre would be premature. And I wonder whether, um, if there were an assurance that she would be able to contribute to their thinking and their work. Would that would that be something that would would be of use? I can see that from your point of view, it's it's not it's too early at this stage. Level. A, a commitment that the the group would take evidence from patients and sufferers, people who had something to contribute, um, of which the petitioner would obviously be a, a leading person. Mm -hmm. I, I was going to ask that we we wrote to the government, and we, we should point out that the petitioner doesn't feel that any of her requests have been met and she talks about parietal cells not even being acknowledged etc we, we should point out on behalf of the petitioner that she, she feels that way but also 
um, perhaps that we we're not sure how much more evidence can be taken. But you know, um, we could ask the government to keep to keep the petitioner updated on, on, on any developments and, and keep her in the loop. But you know, as, as far as the ongoing and the group work is. Um, so than closing it right now, but recognising so. really to a large uh -huh. extent our work is done, uh -huh. seeking assurance kind of that, that, that from, or asking the group, uh -huh. um, would they liaise with her, yeah, would they meet I, I with her so. at a, a reasonable point, and would the government keep her and I, I, groups of people so. that she represents informed? Uh, Angus? Yeah. Um, can I just say for the record, um, picking up on your point um, with regard to Dr Alistair Hart, uh, and the, the request for ongoing liaison uh, with the petitioner, by the petitioner, mm -hmm. um, and his response that uh, the SLWG activity is still at a, a very early stage and it's still to be fully scoped, I would have thought this, that was an ideal time to speak to the petitioner, you know, at, at an early stage rather than later on. So, um, you know, it might be an idea to, to suggest that. Mm -hmm. to them that an early meeting would be better than a, a later meeting. Mm -hmm. And that might satisfy the sense that the petitioner has that, that there's still this lack of, this like a miscommunication with what actually yeah. her concerns are. Mm -hmm. So if we would agree that we would want to, I think really we do feel that we're kind of coming towards a point where there's not much more that the petitions committee can do, but we recognise the importance of the, the that issues have been highlighted, that perhaps through the Scottish Government um, asking that the petitioner is kept um, informed and maybe suggesting to the, you know, that, or looking for an assurance from the group that they, they would want to have a, a discussion with the petitioner. Um, and and the thing to point out is makes is a, a strong one that actually at the very early stages this might be useful and valuable. Is that agreed then? Okay. In that case, if we can move on to petition, the next petition is petition 1517 by Elaine Holmes and Olive McElroy on pro polypropylene mesh medical devices. We last considered this petition on 28th of September when we heard evidence from the petitioners and Dr. Whale Agar. The CLATS note provides a summary of that evidence session. Also circulated with a note um, are a number of submissions from mesh survivors. And again, you know, I think we should record a thanks to those who have taken the time to um, make these submissions. I think a lot of them are highly personal and, and obviously even just difficult probably to draft. Members will recall that we agreed to write to Cabinet Secretary to set out our concerns about the availability of the updated patient information leaflet and the presence of outdated information um, on Scottish Government and NHS Scotland websites. The Cabinet Secretary provided a response on Tuesday of this week, confirming that the Chief Medical Officer wrote to all health boards in May to request that the literature that is available in hospital and primary care premises is up to date. She also advises that NHS Inform has been reviewing and updating its website, providing a link to the current version of the Stress Urinary Incontinence Patients Information Leaflet. That link has been added to the Scottish Government's website. The Cabinet Secretary adds that the Scottish Government is working with Healthcare Improvement Scotland to establish a mesh oversight group. That group will work with health boards to ensure that the recommendations of the independent review are fully implemented and will give further consideration to the patient information that is available. We have previously agreed to publish a report on the petition and have secured time for a debate, although we await confirmation of the timing of that debate. And we should also note that the Deputy Convener and I hope to meet with Professor Alison Britton to discuss the issues and concerns that have been raised in evidence with the committee about the review itself and um, Professor Britton's review of the review. And I wonder if members have any thoughts or suggestions for further action on this petition. Brian? Okay, I, 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 again, I, I think we've, there's been so much evidence um, taken in this particular, uh, particular uh, petition, very much weighted in, in, in the one direction here. I think you know that um, uh, not to speak for everybody on the, on, the, on the committee, but I do get the sense of feeling that we're all driving in the one direction here very strongly. And uh, the fact that we have a we have a um, secured a debate in the chamber, I'm not sure personally uh, that, that I need to hear any more evidence. Uh, on this particular, on this particular topic, um, I, I, I think I've formed a very clear view 
and, and, and the, the direction of travel I think we're going in. Rona? Uh, yourself and Deputy Convener are meeting Professor Britton. Um, can I ask when, is that soon or? Yeah, has been arranged yet? As diaries are, uh -huh. are permitted. Mm -hmm. It was the professor did contact us and said, and thought mm -hmm. it would be useful for us to meet. So that mm -hmm. I think that's been helpful. I think because we are wrestling with the idea, and there's no doubt that the petitioners are wrestling with the idea what the purpose of the review is, because the review is clearly not to mm -hmm. um, address the substance so, of the report, which the patients have been unhappy with. Yes. It has been about process and what the government can learn yes. from that. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I suppose my concern in some ways would be that that review might misrepresent to the, to the petitioners what mm -hmm. the outcome of that might be. They're not. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's mm -hmm. going to revisit the actual findings or recommendations. No, it of could the be a report. diversion from mm -hmm. the core issue of, of of what you know what has happened to to the women and undoubtedly um, you know tragic effects that, that, that the mesh has had on them. Um, right. So, I mean, I think that the draft report coming forward will she crystallise something for us. Um, either way, it has to move on. It has to. It has to continue. And it has been interesting to note that there has been. I think there was a debate in, um, in the House of Commons mm -hmm. in the Westminster Hall, mm -hmm. and it strikes me that it's, it's an issue that now it's gathering it's like momentum. Public yeah. awareness mm -hmm. is catching up with the individual experience mm -hmm. of, the, of, of these women and it does feel as if there's something bigger is going to yeah. develop out of yeah. this rather than individual Definitely. clinical decisions so um, you know, I think we, we would recognise the work of the petitioners themselves in bringing mm -hmm. highlights yeah, in this completely. Brian? I think one, one of the big issues for me is how process has allowed uh, this to evolve to the stage it is at the moment and how it's taken so long for process to, 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 in fact, it's taken the petitioners uh, to bring this to the attention before it's been picked up. I mean, I think in terms of the, the initial reporting uh, of this, I'd be, you know, that, that's one of the things I'm, you know, really interested in mm -hmm. is how, how that process has managed to allow this to happen. Mm -hmm. And, and also the fact that when Alec Neil was Cabinet Secretary, he did step in yeah. and said, you know, there should be um, a moratorium, but it, it still continued, yes, that's which I was saying, and yeah. you know, and I think that that I and the idea, I mean, I, it's difficult to see given the evidence. In what way, that would that would that moratorium wouldn't have been sustained? But then we're not clinicians, so we don't really know what the other options might be. But it does feel as if this, um, and that issue that we've come back to time and again, and which clearly is a matter of the petitions that they weren't believed, yeah. and that the the the, the the, the connection between the the procedure and their subsequent mm -hmm. suffering weren't, weren't believed to be connected to each other. Mm -hmm. um, can I ask that when we do look at the report ahead of the debate that we agree that to meet in private to do that? Yes. I think that would yeah. help our consideration. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there anything else we can usefully do at this time apart from recognising we have got to, in terms of these issues being highlighted, recognise we're going to have a debate, that we will produce a report, um, and that there are issues still for government in terms of what their authority is, in terms of, I mean, because for them, really, the issues, can they follow through in the question of the moratorium, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Yes, I mean, there is obviously a worry that, that this operation is still being carried out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, we heard evidence in some places where it, it literally has ceased by by informing giving patients effective informed choice but um again I'm, i'd be still concerned that you know the, there are women potentially out there having this done who are not well informed about what's going on um, i think it's worth remembering that the women who have been conducting this campaign are you know it's too late for them and it's they're not doing it for themselves they're doing it for for women in the future and, and men i believe as well um, so it's important that we keep it, you know, up there. Very yeah. much so. Yeah. Um, I think we'd be failing if, if we're not mm -hmm. making sure that the debate is being heard out there as well, yeah. so that people can make informed choice. Mm -hmm. Angus. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Going back to the uh, moratorium issue, I think when Dr. Agar was was here giving evidence, 
Um, he explained that the decision to halt mesh procedures ultimately rested with NHS boards, and he was unaware uh, of whether the boards provided any feedback to the Cabinet Secretary or the Scottish Government uh, about their, their views on the moratorium. Now, I would, f if that's the case, uh, that they didn't provide any feedback, I would find that astonishing. And we, we, we really need to get to, to the bottom of that, because, you know, if a moratorium isn't worth the paper it's written on, mm -hmm. you know, what's, what's the point of it? Do we have to health boards to ask about how much activity is occurring in terms of mesh operations at the moment? Um, I think that might be something we want to might reflect in terms of the report. What other information mm -hmm. we want to add into the report? Is that mm -hmm. um, something that we might do? We would maybe go back and establish what evidence we already had in that regard, because I think there was some evidence that established that there wasn't an, an absolute um, uh, moratorium. Can I suggest then that, as um, we've agreed, um, that we would consider a draft report in, in private, we would be looking to gather any other evidence that would inform that report. That's really, just, I don't mean in terms of oral evidence, but just simply um, is a, an up-to-date report from health boards of their understanding of the use of these mm -hmm. procedures. And of course, in due course, the Deputy Community and I can report back on our meeting with Professor mm -hmm. Britton, so if that's agreed. Not doing it really anymore. Okay, if we can then move on to the next continued petition, um, which is Petition 1545 on residential care provision for the severely learning disabled. We last considered this petition on the 11th of May 2017. Members will recall at this meeting that the committee agreed to seek an update from the Scottish Government on the preliminary results of phase one of a project to improve data collection and demand for residential care and identify suitable alternatives to out-of-area placements. The Scottish Government submission states that the themes emerging from phase one of the project include solutions to improving the discharge of people with learning disabilities with complex needs, focusing particularly on suitable accommodation. The submission also highlights that further consultation will be required before any recommendations can be made in terms of strategic direction to support people with learning disabilities with complex needs. The committee also agreed to seek a response from the Scottish Government in relation to concerns raised that the research will not address the gap in knowledge about people with profound and multiple learning disabilities. The submission highlights a range of work streams that have been commissioned to address the data visibility of people with learning disabilities in Scotland. The petitioner's view is that these projects fail to address the issues raised by the petition or the gap in data relating to people in Scotland with profound and multiple learning disabilities. The petitioner also raises concerns that the focus of the projects is largely concentrated on the prescription and effect of antipsychotic drugs. I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for further action. The, the government just to, to inform them of you know the, the petitioner's response and also um, raise the the, the the point about antipsychotic drugs and um, to actually find out um, where the consultation is going and you know and then point out that perhaps this is not going to address the concerns of the petitioner. Yeah, there is a frustration there from the petitioner's point of view. That like, yeah. There's lots of work being done, but, 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 but is it the right but work? It's, but it's, yeah. it's missing. It's not yeah, really, and point. it's not bad work, but yeah. it's not really addressing the yeah. questions raised yeah, by the petitioner. So. Yeah. You just seem to be going around in circles, really. I know. Um, I mean, I, obviously, underpinning this is, and I think she makes the point in her last sentence, where she says, "We need action. We need substantial funding, and we need a clear plan." Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, at the moment, all three of those are missing, with the centre one being probably the stumbling block, mm -hmm. potentially. Um, if you don't know, I, mean, I think the petitioner has mm -hmm. always said, if you don't know the scale of the problem, yeah. or, you or you know where people are, what their issues are, what support they require, you can't then meet that need but, within communities. But it's interesting, because all of these individuals will be on the radar. They are not flying under the radar, all of them will have medical and social work involvement at some level. I'm not um, sure if that's true, actually. I think the point of the petition is that... If you have, if you have complex is. needs, you, you almost certainly have some input at some level. Mm -hmm. um, the issue really is, is, do we have any system for gathering that data? And I think that's, that's where we are missing it. 
because they're not all being put into the same data system. Brian? Just to start, we're obviously in a state of flux at the moment in terms of the integration of the boards, etc., and how the, the services like this are delivered. Is, is, is that something that's you know impacting or impairing uh, but delivery I'm, of service? I wonder if it's as simple as you know what they're looking for in these circumstances um, are residential care options, which, and there aren't any. So what happens to folk remain supported at home and? Their needs are not, or they're, they're, they're sent out of their own local area um, because there's not sufficient appropriate accommodation yeah. or support where they where they live. You just get the sense that you know data is important, yes, but the, the whole focus of it shouldn't just be on data because the problem exists. Mm -hmm. um, the data is useful to back to back up, but there's, there's undoubtedly a problem with with residential care, and so that seems to have been kind of overlooked. I think. Mm -hmm. I suppose the main thing we would be wanting to highlight and point of what you just um, you raised, Rona, was the mismatch between the, the problem and the response. That yeah. not, there's Targeting nothing wrong with it, no. the response, but it's not really relating to the no. core issue that's been highlighted. And if we can maybe write to the Scottish Government um, to ask, as you said, about the consultation and to respond to the petitioner's comments. Mm -hmm. Is that agreed? That's agreed. That's strategic direction, isn't yeah. it? Mm -hmm. Okay, in that case, we can move on. The next petition is petition 1596 by Paul Anderson on in-care survivor service Scotland. At our previous consideration of this petition in January, we agreed to write to Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for Education Skills to seek clarity on the interim finance arrangements and to ask him to address the petitioner's concerns about the long-term sustainability of funding and the potential adverse impact on service users in the event of a loss of skills and continuity of contact. In the submission of 13 February, the Deputy First Minister indicated that, since the change in funding, there had been continuity in support, adding that survivors are able to access a broader range of support to address their individual needs through the fund. The Scottish Government's previous submission of 18 January also indicated that it employed a survivor engagement manager and intended to create an engagement plan designed Court to capture the views and concerns of more survivors in the future. The petitioner has acknowledged that the interim finance arrangements have led to improvements, but expresses concerns that there is no formal agreement with regard to the ongoing support to survivors by open secret. He stresses his view of the importance of the consistency and continuity of relationships between survivors and their counsellors. He asked whether survivors have been consulted about their needs and what opportunities they have to provide input to discussions about their health. Uh, and I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Karina. Angus. Yeah, thanks, um, Karina. I think it's, it's worth noting um, at the outset that uh, the Deputy First Minister has said that no survivor has had to change or lose support since the, the change in funding was, was introduced. Um, <clears throat> I also note the petitioner has acknowledged that the Scottish Government has provided assurances with regard to the service delivery crossover between Open Secret and the In Care Survivor Support Fund, uh, and that these have been delivered. Um, however, that said, uh, the petitioner, I think, does raise a couple of valid questions. Uh, namely, have survivors from ICSSS been consulted about what they need and about changes now in place and in the future? And secondly, whether there's any evidence uh, that survivors have had the opportunity to provide input when decisions about the future health have been discussed. I think these are two salient points, uh, two valid questions. Um, so I would certainly uh, be keen to, to, to seek an update from the Scottish Government on the, the role of the survivor engagement manager that you mentioned earlier uh, and the progress uh, or any progress that's been ongoing, uh, with regard to ongoing, the, the ongoing engagement plan, uh, given the questions posed by the petitioner. Okay. Uh, Rona? Okay, um, with everything that Angus has said, I think I get the sense that the petitioner is looking for some security, um, and there's still, there's still a doubt in his mind, and I also think um, he, he does ask valid questions about the involvement of the survivors and whether there has been enough. Um, so I think there, there are questions that we need to ask, ask the government, um, and we should take that forward on behalf of the petitioner. Okay, 
Michelle? Yeah, w w what we always find with these changeovers quite often is it, it's not about whether there is a service available for people, but it's, it is the model of that service. Um, and I think what might be useful if it was feasible to do it is a side-by-side -side comparison of what they had and what they're getting, mm -hmm. because it's things like time-limited intervention yeah. that actually significantly change um, a, a, a user's experience of what they're getting and the value of what they're getting. Mm -hmm. um, and I think frustration from, from workers and you know, coming from the petitioner is the lack of recognition of what was being offered. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the new model is stripping some of the, the import, what they consider to be the important content of what was being offered. Um, so I think it'd be quite useful to have that direct comparison, perhaps. I guess. I, I think I think the point though is that um, the the, the in care survivors who were getting support from Open Secret were still entitled to that support. They were still getting that support if they wanted it. There's a separate so. question about what would happen if somebody else now refers themselves, you know, there's now an issue, and I think this is an ongoing debate amongst survivor groups. I'm a member of the cross-party group and um, adult survivors of, of child sexual abuse, and that's very much something that exercises them, and, it, and, and some of that's reflected in this petition. But I think Angus is absolutely right to say, in terms of the petition, of those who have had that service, it will continue. Yes. But I think they put the questions that he has asked um, are legitimate ones to pursue with the government. I wonder if that's... Um, that, that you know the, the broader questions about strategy um, have, have been um, highlighted, I think. But I think the very specific points that Angus made are ones that we can we pursue. Okay, is that agreed? In that case, if we can move on to our next petition, which is Petition One Six O Seven by Peter Gregson, on behalf of Kids Not Suits and congestion charging in major Scottish cities. A previous consideration of this petition was in November 2016, when we agreed to defer further consideration until the publication and scrutiny of the draft third report on policies and proposals, RPP3. The note by the clerk provides an update on scrutiny of RPP3 and notes that the final RPP3 is expected to be published in the first quarter of 2018. The note also refers to the inquiry into air pollution in Scotland currently being undertaken by the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. It also highlights the Scottish Government's undertaking in its programme for 2017-18 to introduce low emission zones in Scotland's four biggest cities by 2020, with the first zone introduced by the end of 2018. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Brian? Um. I personally find this a really interesting uh, petition, um, and that we have to have we have to get some capital from somewhere to to uh, if we're going to instigate, you know, um, uh, or, change, or change the transport around the cities, and certainly for me personally around uh, being able to cycle. Uh, uh, so I think it's a really, really, really interesting uh, uh, petition. Um, I would quite like to pass this on uh, to the ECCL. I've got to, be, I've got to say because I don't think there's much more we can do, given the given that uh, the government are already uh, making some moves in this. But I think the the evidence the petition has brought and the evidence we've taken, I think, is something that would really help that committee in their consideration. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. Well, as a member of the Equair committee, um, we've I can say that we've just started our work on the air quality inquiry, so um, we'd certainly welcome. The petition, I'm sure. I can't speak for the committee, but... <laughs> yeah, um, <clears throat> so um, we've got <laughs> we've got considerable work uh, still to do on, on the issue, but the, the, the main point for me uh, with regard to this petition is the fact that um, it, the, the, the petitioner's requests have basically been addressed in the programme for government. Um, with the Scottish Government saying that it will introduce LEZs or low emission zones uh, in the four biggest cities by, by 2020. So it's a prime example, I think, of, uh, I mean, I don't know how long the petition has been going, quite a few, a few, quite a few months, um, but it's a, an example of how this petition system can help to um, direct government uh, policy. Okay. Um I think it is to be welcomed that the Scottish Government has made a commitment on um, LEZs. I think we would want then to 
close the petition. The only question is whether we're simply making the other committee aware of it or are we actually referring it to them? And I, I suppose I would bow to your um, wisdom in this, Angus, for which would be better, which is going to cause us less grief. Well, perhaps it might be a suggestion to make the committee aware of the petition rather than uh, refer the full petition to the committee because we are in a far better place than when the petition was okay. submitted. So. so if that's agreed that um, we would want to um, close the petition really on the basis that much of what the petition has sought is, in, is now in process. The, the, the issue underneath it has clearly been recognised as a, an important issue and I think it's right to underline the comments by um, Angus MacDonald on the role of the Petitions Committee and of the Petitioner in highlighting these issues and actually um, securing some progress. And we would, of course, wish to make the ECCLR Committee aware of the petition um, in relation to its inquiry into air quality in Scotland. Is that agreed? Thank you. If we can then move on then to the next petition for consideration, which is Petition 1616 on parking legislation. We last considered this petition in February and agreed to defer further consideration of the petition until the Scottish Government's consultation on parking was complete. The consultation is now closed and is anticipated that an analysis of the responses received will be published in autumn 2017. I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for further action. Brian? I think that where we are just now is, is uh, given that the consultation is now due is to, is to write to the Scottish Government and, and ask what action they, they propose to take. Yeah. That's for an update from them. I think, so. I think that's, you know, that's common sense to do that. Yep. Although I think, having looked at it, I also think it's unbelievably challenging in terms of how, given the number of households that now have cars in comparison with in the past, and I think that there are clearly big issues for if you're in a wheelchair or you know you've got a pram or whatever. Now navigating away around some of our streets, particularly in my own city of Glasgow, but uh, I think it'd be worthwhile finding out from the Scottish government um, now that the uh, presumably they have to respond. That, so it's the outcome of the, the is it analysis of the consultation that's been published. Well, it's the, so it's the analysis of the consultation that's due to be published, and then presumably the Scottish Government responds to that. So we would be asking them to keep us updated on what, what their intention is. Yeah. Well, you would hope certainly that. never do. Yeah. Okay. okay. In that case, if we could now move on to... Petition 1621 by Jim Robertson on sepsis awareness, diagnosis and treatment. At our last consideration of this petition, on 29th of June, the committee agreed to write to the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport, expressing our view that it would be appropriate for the Scottish Government to launch a national public awareness campaign. In her initial response on the 11th of August, the Cabinet Secretary indicated that the Scottish Government did not feel it was necessary to launch a national public awareness campaign, but that it would continue to work closely with NHS Scotland, the Fiona Elizabeth Agnew Trust and other stakeholders on raising awareness of sepsis. The Cabinet Secretary subsequently announced a national public awareness campaign on the 27th of September and in correspondence to the committee on 17th of October indicated that the campaign is expected to commence in early 2018. The petitioner has stated in his submission that he's very pleased that a national public awareness campaign will now go ahead. Well, I'm not quite sure whether the minister actually met directly with the, the petitioner himself. Um, I wonder if members have any views on action to take in this petition. It's going to go ahead, I think, really. And yeah. I think based on that, our work is done. Any other views? Angus? Well, I think it has to be said that, uh, excuse my lack of knowledge of Latin here, but as volt facies go, this one was a cracker. <laughs> <laughs> Having been told that uh, there would be no awareness done, and then um, told that there will now be uh, awareness made. So, so I'm delighted that the government has uh, paid heed to the petition and the call from this committee that, uh, that the awareness yeah. session should be made. Yep. And, and I think we would want to acknowledge the role of the petitioner. Again, like in so many circumstances, in very difficult times, kind of trying at least out of, out of terrible circumstances to improve public policy. And um, and I think the achievement of a, a, 
a public awareness campaign, which clearly the Scottish Government wasn't inclined to do and had been given advice not to do, but the force of the argument has obviously been um, very strong, and I think that the, the petitioners to be commended for their, their fortitude in, in, in bringing this forward. I also thought that it probably would be something... I thought one of the interesting arguments was this issue around the good of a national awareness campaign, because people would refer themselves in appropriately. That wherever that thinking is, mm -hmm. you would hope that you know the cabinet secretary has had a look at what what was what was forming that advice, mm -hmm. because that is something you would you would I, I get you don't want people inappropriately to be worried about their own health or about inappropriately referring themselves, but surely that would be better than somebody not realising what was happening and not getting the medical attention that they that they needed. So, so the whole point of that national campaign is so that people can identify correctly what is happening and know how to respond quickly and it actually is hugely beneficial to the nhs if people come early and you catch things before they progress too far so you know it was a very odd decision at first mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. can i just say that, that i mean this petitioner is a constituent of mine and um, everything that's been said you know i agree with and, and he is extremely grateful um to the committee um and for the decision that was taken eventually um and I think he feels it was very worthwhile bringing yeah. it to the, to the committee. So I, I'm personally delighted, and I know he is too. And I think there's been a, you know, obviously he has been part of a broader campaign, and they should yes, all be commended been, and, yeah. on really, you know, pushing pushing government to do things they don't want to do is mm. is is, an, is a great achievement. In that basis, are we agreeing to um, close the petition on the basis that the Scottish government has confirmed it will launch a national public awareness campaign? If that's agreed. agreed. And again, we would wish, wish to um, note the efforts of the petitioner and other stakeholders in securing this positive outcome. If we can move on then to our next petition, which is Petition 1627 on Consent for Mental Health and Treatment for People Under 18 Years of Age. We last considered this petition on the 20th of April and at that meeting agreed to write to the Scottish Government and the Royal College of Psychiatrists, Faculty of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. <laughs> The committee asked the Scottish Government how the petitioner could contribute to the Chief Medical Officer's review of the consent process for people who receive care and support in Scotland. The response indicated that patients are already represented in the review process, but that it was considered how the petitioner could be further involved. The committee also asked what funding is in place for the Links Worker Programme and the number and location of general practices participating in the programme. The clerk's note summarises the information provided by the Scottish Government. The committee asked Royal College of Psychiatrists and Scotland's Faculty of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry for its view on the clinical guidelines for mental health conditions in children and adolescents in the context of this petition. The response stated that there was universal support for maintaining the rights to confidentiality of young people who can give informed consent to treatment. The faculty's response concluded by stating that they would be very happy to work with other colleagues about how to support young people accessing high quality, timely services for mental health disorders in Scotland. The petitioner has indicated she does not feel the answers have been received to the questions raised by the committee. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for further action. Brian? I think, I think, I think we were all fairly moved by the, you know, the, the petitioner herself when she came in here and, and, and gave her own you know, uh, you know, experiences. Um, uh, you know, you can't be failed to be moved by that. I think you know, I would just like to know that it raises a, it raised a bigger issue for me. And, and you know, there obviously is a massive uh, issue of confidentiality, but also the competence uh, of, of somebody going to, uh, presenting with mental health issues um, uh, to to a doctor, and then the, their competence to be able to to take their medication as as prescribed. Uh, in terms of being, being given a month's worth uh, worth of drugs, I, I think it ho for me it opened. It's not what the petitioner is asking for, and I do appreciate that. But for me, it opens a whole uh, it's a different ball game here in terms of you know how we how we're approaching the treatment of mental health. Um, I, and I do appreciate the petitioner's talking about under 18s, but for me, it, it, it kind of the thought process was much wider than that. And uh, I, I would quite like to. to uh, bring the minister for, for mental health and to get her, opi her, her yeah. opinion and the government's opinion on how we could take this forward because it's obviously an extremely complex yeah. uh, process here. Okay. Anyone else? I agree, but I wonder whether we ought to be asking the chief medical officer to be present as well. 
um, because of the complexity of, and, and the nature of this, I think um, the minister alone would not be adequate. Mm. Although there's no doubt that the minister can bring whomsoever she likes, but that might be something that we would mm. be we'd be content with with um, the chief medical officer being there as well, Rona. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I I think it's agreeing with what Brian's saying. You know, it's it's a, it's a big issue. There are almost two separate issues, and it's how mental health care is delivered to young people. But I can understand why the petitioner feels her her questions have not been answered because it doesn't directly address confidentiality. Mm -hmm. It's more about support. The, the answers that we were given is more about support and links, uh, links workers, etc. It's not about the specific question of confidentiality for for under 18s. I think the issue, that, as I understand it, is that the solution that um, Annette McKenzie identified was that if she had known mm -hmm. she would have been able to support her yeah. daughter, which yeah. is utterly compelling, mm -hmm. is put against from the, the medical profession, indeed from the youth organisation's point mm -hmm. of view, the importance of young person feeling yeah. that they can go uh -huh. um, and seek help um, and be, have con confidentiality. Now, mm -hmm. there must be a middle ground between where actually having the support of your family if you're in those circumstances yeah. would not necessarily be a, a bad thing. Yeah. And, the, and that compelling mm -hmm. argument about even if she had known she would have maybe been able to manage the help dis her. dispensing yeah. of the, of the, yeah, of the exactly. drugs. Um, and so <coughs> I think that there is something here that has been highlighted by this terrible case, mm -hmm. which may not, the solution may not be what um, our petitioner has suggested, but there must be something else. And I think that, that broader question is something I would certainly be interested um, in exploring with the Minister, that, you know, is what, what, what are the guidelines around <laughs> how much medication you hand to somebody yeah. who may be in a vulnerable situation or are there other ways yeah. where you can manage prescription of drugs? It is an area that we don't, I certainly don't know a great deal about, but I think mm -hmm. that, that um, the petitioner... Is, is, has described circumstances which we think need to be addressed. The solution she identifies may be one that some people feel is problematic, but I think we would want to look at it further with the minister. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd be quite interested in how widespread. Uh, we may have we may have asked this in the initial evidence session, but um, just how widespread is it for for you know children or under 18 still living at home, being prescribed um, drugs without anyone else knowing? Um, you know, was this down to a doctor's decision, um, and is it quite unusual, or is it, or is it widespread mm -hmm. happening? I'm not mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. So we need to kind of find that out. That's, uh, I suppose the difficulty is about um, for every GP to have a depth of knowledge and understanding of mental health issues, of being able to have the time to assess a patient to the degree that you would. I mean. You know, for a young girl who's reporting night terrors and all the rest of it, you know, I would have expected to see some wider assessment of that young person. Um, and sometimes that's down to availability of services. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a referral to CAMS or whatever. And I suppose there's something about the pathways that are available um, because we know there's a huge delay in assessment now for many young people. So, so there's, a, there's a, a wider and bigger issue here. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think there would, I would also maybe like to hear from some of the leading young mental health charities for young people who do provide some of this wider support and what their views are, because often young people will go and talk to a voluntary agency where they feel their confidence will be kept. Um, but at least then they do have a point of support. I suppose I had so. always thought that there would be an aversion to prescribing drugs to a young person that you would try all sorts of other things first. But, I mean, I wasn't in the... I clearly wasn't not in a position to understand what the, the actual consultation was like. So, and we did, you know, I think we did ask for comments from uh, the GPs, and they, their emphasis was on the question of confidentiality too, but that they would give advice to a patient to speak to family members and look for support. So um, I think there are, there are a number of issues here we want to explore with the Minister and perhaps look at what's further you know, witnesses alongside the minister we would want to have yes, along. Because you'd want to know why she wasn't signposted for mental yeah. health support, really. I mean, Although we would always... Like, I mean, uh, I think the, the, the question, individual case, my understanding is that um, 
there isn't any action pending against anyone, so um, we would be looking at it in, in policy terms mm -hmm. and practice terms rather than about the individual sure. case. But but that's about care pathways, isn't it? So that if a young person comes in, they should always be referred well, to, I mean, I to mental health that's support. The petitioners looking for, for guidelines for, for GPs exactly. and whether this should actually be happening at all. Yeah. Have a, a very high degree of autonomy mm -hmm. in how they mm -hmm. deliver uh, they deliver care. Um, so it's all down. It's, it then goes it goes back down to how they are their, tra their training mm -hmm. in this particular I suppose uh, issue. Don't want to take that away. But no. you do want to have very good guidelines. Yeah, so you want them you know, to feel as questions as can be asked. Mm. You know, and if a, if a GP perhaps is under phenomenal pressure, is it easier to prescribe rather than to direct people and, and yeah. speak to them? Now the only question I suppose I would ask is. In terms of, we want the minister in, they may bring the chief medical officer. Do we want to have oral evidence from some of these mental health charities, or do you want to seek written evidence? I, I think it would be interesting, you know, if you if you had them all together as a panel, so that they could share views mm. on it, because so I suppose the only question would be, sorry to interrupt you, that if you're asking the, the minister to respond, then I think it would have to be two separate panels. So. Mm. And you yeah. might even need to have time for the Minister to reflect on what that evidence mm. was. So that would give you a, a more substantial... This is what they take the view now, the Minister. So we could maybe timetable it in that way. Could I suggest we speak to the voluntary sector first, then, so uh -huh. that we can yeah, reflect yeah, on what yeah. they say to yeah. us, the Minister? Uh -huh. Yeah, that would be logical. I think, I think in this particular uh, petition is that I'm not absolutely clear which direction we're going to go in, and I don't think anybody here is, you know, probably, no. you know, in a position that we, we would be clear, but, but we recognise there is, there's, there is an something issue here, here of some, yeah. of some yeah. description. I think I think it would be fair to the petitioner and to and to their family to say, if not what's proposed in the petition, then what yeah. instead? Because clearly there's something here that's yeah. not right. So what would what if it's not the question of, of um, breaching confidentiality? What is it instead? Okay. So I think there's quite a lot there, that, and we do recognise just how difficult it is for the petitioner and, the, and their families because of their individual and very direct experience of this. If we can then move on to the next petition, which is Petition 161 on Child Welfare Hearings. We'll ask us to this petition at our meeting in May, and at that meeting we agreed to write to the Scottish Government and the Family Law Committee of the Scottish Civil Justice Council. The committee sought to establish the cost of implementing digital recordings of child welfare hearings. The Scottish Government estimated this would be approximately £390,000 in addition to ongoing running costs. Regardless of these costs, the Scottish Government is of the view that it would be inappropriate to record child welfare hearings as they are not structured as evidential hearings and there is a risk that it might increase their formality. The petitioner's response stated that the costs estimated by the Scottish Government seemed prohibitively expensive and that child welfare hearings should not be measured only in costs. The petitioner also highlighted that child welfare hearings at the proof stage are recorded and questioned why this could not be the case for ordinary child welfare hearings. The committee also sought to establish whether the pro forma used in children's hearings to produce a record of proceedings could be adapted for use in child welfare hearings. The Scottish Government confirmed that there is scope for the pro forma to be adapted. In its submission, the Family Law Committee of the Scottish Civil Justice Council highlighted that a subcommittee has been set up to take forward work in relation to case management, including considering ways to achieve greater continuity in how child welfare cases are handled. The Scottish Government is represented on the subcommittee and will provide an update to the committee after the subcommittee has reported to the Family Law Committee on the 23rd of October 2017, so it's just passed. I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for further action. Can I ask a question? I mean, obviously, I haven't been present for it previously, um, but in terms of a verbatim recording, um, why is that not done, or why can it not be done in just a very simplified form of a, of a, mm, yeah, a little trans transcript recording? You know, it's made to be remarkable. It's going to cost so much when most of us could probably record these things now. Yeah, well, that, that's, sorry, that's what I was kind of getting mm -hmm. at, you know, on yeah. these little digital uh -huh. recorders that you just mm -hmm. stick down. I mean, they're not expensive to buy. Mm -hmm. You get the recording and then I suppose there's a cost if you want to type it up. But if you use a, a, a stored digital one, mm -hmm. you can just keep it. So I'm unclear. I mean, there would be other costs in terms of recording it, storing it, and so on. But mm -hmm. I suppose the point of the petitioner was 
that where it wasn't the same person that was dealing with the case every time. Mm -hmm. The case was being restated and the, the evidence that established what the issues were, were were sometimes being missed and their frustration mm -hmm. that you know you were having to remake mm -hmm. the case or the point of the argument was being lost because there wasn't a, a record at, mm -hmm. at every stage. Yeah, I, I, Rona? I, I, I agree with the petitioner that child welfare hearings shouldn't be measured at only in costs. Mm -hmm. um, and at, you know, 390,000 sounds like a lot for what we're asking, but in actual fact, I don't think it's, you know, weighing up against the, the service it would give, I don't think it's it, it's too too much. However, um, given that the um, subcommittee um, was reporting to the Family Law Committee a few days ago, I think we should um, ask the Scottish Government to provide us an update on the outcome of that so that we know where we are with it. OK. Is that agreed? Okay. Is there anything else we can do further just now? Probably not. No. OK. Thank you for that. If we can then move on to petition 1646 by Carolyn Hayes on drinking water supplies in Scotland. We first considered this petition on 25th of May when we agreed to write to the Scottish Government, Scottish Water, the Drinking Water Quality Regulator, SEPA, NHS Highland and the Water Industry Commission for Scotland. It is encouraging to note that they all provided submissions which have been included with our meeting papers. The committee sought to establish whether the protocols within the regulatory regime were sufficiently robust and whether there was any conflict of interest within the regime. The submissions clarify the responsibilities under the framework and consider that there is no conflict of interest. The Drinking Water Quality Regulator submission included a background note on the specific local issue which led to submission of the petition. In its response to the committee's request for comments on concerns raised in the petition about potential health impacts, NHS Highlands submission provides a summary report of the local investigation conducted by its health protection team. The summary report identifies, quote, anecdotal opinion of an increase in health impacts such as skin complaints, but notes that there is a, quote, lack of evidence of any increased prevalence. In her submission, the petitioner reiterates concerns about the disinfectant by-products associated with chloramination and asks how Scottish Water monitors these by-products. I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for further action. And we, we did have a very substantial um, uh, sort of response in terms of the, of the various groups of people that we spoke to. Yeah. Brian? I mean, on a wider note, I think that um, a few cases, the constituency case and myself, around the, the quality of water and the measurement of the quality of water, um, and, and actually, the, it seems to me that there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, 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 an ambiguity around um, which agency is responsible for that, in that, that measurement, whether it be SEPA, whether it be Scottish Water, and, and I certainly think there's some sort of clarification around that. Uh, I would certainly welcome that. Okay. Uh, I don't know how we go to go about doing that, but I'd like to understand specifically whose responsibility that is. Sorry. Okay, we can. That's information that we can provide to members. Okay. Um, I think. I think, given that we've, you know, we've got so much, so much in the submissions, and some of it's quite technical, um, we, we should write to Scottish Water just to. I mean, the main issue here seems to be about safety. Um, the petitioner acknowledges that the water apply is safe, but asks um, if whether the um, drinking water quality regulator is sufficiently effective in ensuring the water is also pleasant to drink. Um, so I think given that, you know, I would say the main issue is safety, um, we need to ask Scottish Water what measures um, They'll be put, they have put in or will put in to monitor the quality and safety of the water uh, sub, you know, subsequent to chloramination um, mm -hmm. and, and see where they are with that. Okay. Is that, is that agreed? Can I, I agree. do that? Yeah. yeah. They Anything are slightly else? two different things, aren't they? The safety <coughs> yeah. and the pleasantness yeah, of the water. Yeah, yeah. Um, because as you go across the country, some places That's I right. think the water's pretty standard, icky to drink, yeah. but it's pretty icky to drink because it has to be more heavily... 
chlorinated to make it safe. Mm. So I, I think it's quite a difficult one, actually. Um, and presumably, or uh, not presumably, I think probably safety has to come first. Um, <laughs> on balance, yes. You know, if it's not going to kill you, it might not be particularly pleasant to drink, but it's not going to kill you, you know. So um, I think this is always going to be an ongoing problem, to be per perfectly honest. Um, I think, you know, at any time you are free to, to ask for your water to be tested um, and SEPA are the primary environmental mm -hmm. regulator, as things stand, as I understand it. Um, but I think certainly it's... Uh, I don't think it's one that's going to go away any time soon. OK. Mm. And just... Yeah, I think it's worth noting, Convener, that both uh, SEPA and Scottish Water, um, their operations come under the remit of uh, the Clare Committee. So, um, depending on how this, this uh, petition progresses, um, it may well be worth highlighting to the Clare Committee that, they, that, that there has been an issue. In fact, I don't have the, the work programme details in front of me, but I think Scottish Water may be due to come in eh, pretty soon to give evidence, so um, it may be an opportune time to, to raise the issue at the Clare Committee as well. OK, well, can we be um, liaised with the, the committee through the clerks and when that might be, make sure that the, these issues have been highlighted to them ahead of that, of that session? So if that's um, agreed, we would be writing to Scotch Water as suggested and highlight the, the issue to the Clare Committee. If we can then move on to the final petition for consideration today, which is Petition 1647 by Angus O'Henley on protection for all employees in NHS Scotland. We previously considered this petition on the 25th of May. Submissions received from the Scottish Government, Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, Health and Safety Executive and BMA Scotland all consider that the existing legislative framework provides the protections requested within the petition, whether that is under existing common law and statutory offences or specifically within the terms of the Emergency Workers Scotland Act 2005. BMA Scotland, however, considers that an extension of the legislation as requested in the petition may act as a deterrent and that a potential benefit of adding non-medical staff to those protected under the 2005 Act might raise the profile of assaults on, for example, receptionists, porters or auxiliary staff, although it does consider that this could equally be achieved through education. Education has identified the Scottish Government as a, quote, priority area of focus at this time, along with enforcement of existing legislation. The petitioner acknowledges the protections available under common law, but considers that, quote, a specific offence with a statutory sentence may well deter um, and would, would be assailants from attacking all NHS employees and volunteers. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for further action. Vested interest. I spent many years in the NHS and have been on the receiving end of, of this. Um, it is a management issue, um, and most hospitals now have clear signs that say they won't tolerate, they have a zero tolerance um, of aggression towards staff. The law is there, and it has been used, and people have been prosecuted for attacking NHS staff. But I think it's not just about NHS staff. Um, we have a problem for police officers, we have a problem for fire service, we have a, it, it stems across all public sectors to some some degree, and to private sector and voluntary sector. Um, I, I, I would be personally a bit wary, therefore, in saying one group need protection more than others, because I think the law is there already. It's about how we use it, and it's about how we um, structure the way in which we operate our front doors and all the rest of it. And ultimately, it's cultural. It's about how people behave. Mm. Um, so, you know. Right. I, I was I was going to actually say something similar in terms of not just with NHS staff. You know, I, I, you know we, we know about the tax on police officers. We know the tax on on the fire service as well, and uh, and the the law is there. Uh, um, the statute of law is already there, and it's whether or not it it's within our remit to try and suggest that uh, any kind of law is, is strengthened, uh, or whether we deem that, that uh, an assault on our you know at that sort of service industry. Should be, uh, it should be deemed a, a, a worse crime. Uh, I don't know whether that's within our remit at all to do that. I know, I know what I think. I mean, I think having been around when the, the legislation initially came in, it was the idea that um, ambulance workers would be attacked as they were trying to yeah. um, treat somebody, or a you know a firefighter would be attacked as they're trying to get somewhere to put out a, a fire. 
Um, this was all, this was all round the argument, and it then developed. For example, Shop Workers Union Asda had a campaign with protection of shop workers who, again, as we come up to Christmas, will be subject to all sorts of abuse. Um, and so it's about general protections. But there is also this question, which we're now wrestling with in, in other legislation, but sending out a message and the deterrent effect of actually having legislation, which um, is also important. So I can see the motives behind this and, and the merits in it. The question is whether is it actually um, necessary. It feels like somehow to say it's not necessary implies that you don't think there's a problem. So yeah. I think that's the, the challenge we have to... Yeah. The issue as well is is attacks on on staff come in in different forms, so there are people who are just just of that ilk who who think that attacking people is is quite reasonable. There are people who are under massive distress or pain who are reacting in a way that they probably wouldn't react if they were or behave if they were you know um, in a different place. Um, and I, I don't. I think we do need to send out very clear messages that it's unacceptable. But it's about creating layers of law. Mm -hmm. Because if we're not prosecuting them already, why would we suddenly then be prosecuting? Because the law is already there. So it's about using the law we already have and being very clear about it and sending those messages out clearly. If you assault somebody in this department or on the street when they're trying to help, we will prosecute you. And we have to then do that. If, if we're not already doing that, why would bringing another law in suddenly make us do it? That, that's my issue. Mm. Any other views? Well, I mean, the, the government submission states that in 2008, the Emergency Workers Scotland Act was extended to provide legal protection mm -hmm. to ambulance workers, doctors, nurses yeah, and midwives, exactly. and that the penalty is up to 12 months imprisonment or a 10,000 fine or both. So, as Michelle said, it's there. The legislation mm -hmm. is there. Um, so perhaps just pursuing a you know a greater public public awareness campaign might might uh, be the answer, but to a large extent it is cultural as well. So it is. It's, it's, so it's a difficult do one. Do want to, to write the Scottish government um, on how they would take forward their focus on public education and ensuring enforcement, and, and are they looking at you know how many cases are there in a year? I think, I think it comes back to starting at the beginning, you know, in, in terms of prevention, and it's about how we educate our young people when they're coming to school about about what is necessary. And we used to use a program that was developed about how you can find yourself in a situation where you, you, you behave violently and then the consequences are massive, not only for the person to whom you're violent to, but also for you as an individual if you end up down, down a court procedure. So I think, I think if we were looking at how to stop this, we should be looking at what processes we have within education, about what messages are up front, and what actions we take when somebody does misbehave. Mm. Um, and I think it's a combined, a three-pronged attack, mm. if you like. But, but we have to be consistent, and I don't think we're always consistent at the moment. So I think the, the, the question for the committee, though, and that's a much broader question, is whether we hold on to the petition in order to establish what Scottish Government's doing around the public education programme, or we close the petition on the basis that these things are being done, um, the le legislation is adequate, there may be a question about enforcement. And I it wonder if there's views on that. Is there an argument for bringing it to debate to the chamber so that that, that it actually highlights mm -hmm. the feelings and, and I think in terms of it. Um, mm -hmm. committee slots, I think we've been over allocated already. So mm. I would think it would be unlikely that we would get another slot. Whether individual parties would want to bring it forward mm -hmm. as a different matter, but I don't think we would be entitled to. The, I think there's something like between twelve and fifteen slots in a year. And we have already had one, and we'd be expecting at least another two, so mm -hmm. um, I think that would not necessarily be an option. But I suppose in terms of deciding, do we want to take a bit further, ask Scottish Government for a bit more information, or do we want to close the petition? Angus. Can we now be minded to close the petition under Rule 15.7, standing orders on the basis that existing legislation and common law are considered to provide sufficient protection for staff? Mm -hmm. But also, you know, in the hope that there would be better uh, public education in the future. Could we then maybe agree to close the petition, but however, write the Scottish Government with um, our reflections on the petition and the importance of enforcement and public education 
and say to me, think these are matters that, that they need to sit alongside the legislation itself. Yes, I think they are recognising there's an issue, but we don't think that more law is the way to address it. Okay, yes, agreed. is that agreed? agreed. Okay, in that case, we're agreeing to um, close the petition on the basis that existing legislation and common law are considered to provide sufficient protection for staff, but we do think the Scottish Government uh, needs to be alive to the issue of public education and to be monitoring um, enforcement. Um, and with that, um, can I thank everybody for their attendance and conclude our business for today and close the meeting.